Hello, my name is Lucas Mann, and I pastor the Spring Church in Lawrence, just a few minutes from here. And um, I come out here this afternoon to bring to you the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, to plead with you concerning your souls. Friends, I come out here out of a care for you, out of a care for where you're going to spend eternity. For I know that the Bible says you will either spend eternity in a place called hell, a place of torment for the wicked, or you will spend eternity in heaven with the saints of God and with God Himself. And friends, I do know that from the Scriptures, the only way that you can possibly enter into heaven is through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that your soul can be saved is by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ is by living in submission to the Son of God, trusting alone in His finished work. And it is that work that I seek to make known this afternoon here at this place. To make known that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. Jesus said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ came into the world to save sinners, and how He did so was He lived for them, He fulfilled the law for them, went to the cross and died for them, satisfying the wrath of God against their sin, and was raised on the third day. Raised to life and exalted in glory. Forty days later, at the right hand of the Majesty on high, and all who look to the Son of God for life, all who embrace Christ and trust alone in His finished work, will have salvation. Not only from sin, in terms of their standing before God, they will not only be freed from that condemnation which they were once in, but they will be freed from the power of sin in their lives. Friends, I'm here to call out sin and to warn you concerning sin. To warn you to flee sin. To flee the horrible effects that sin has upon your soul. To plead with you that you would not bring upon yourself eternal ruin by living a life of sin. By living in blatant immorality and gluttony and greed and sexual perversion and pride and religious hypocrisy. I'm here to plead with you that you would flee those things. I'm here to exhort you to flee from those evil deeds to repent and of course to believe the gospel and ultimately this is an act of worship and praise to God for God is worthy to be praised God is worthy to be honored and exalted especially in the public places through the preaching of the Word of God in the open air this is an act of worship unto the true God in fact Psalm Psalm 150 speaks of praising God. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Verse 6, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Indeed, friends, because of what God has done in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the atoning work of Christ upon the cross, he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be honored and exalted as the King of glory. So, as I preach, may He be glorified. Indeed and indeed. The text of Scripture that I would like to highlight before you this afternoon is found in the book of Romans. It is found in Romans chapter 3, in verses 25 and 26. The Apostle Paul is writing here concerning the cross of Jesus Christ, concerning the death of the Son of God upon the cross. And he says these words. He says, This was to demonstrate His righteousness, because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time. My friends, this text speaks to the reality that Jesus' death upon the cross was a demonstration of the righteousness of God. That Christ's work was a demonstration of the righteousness of God. See, God is a holy God and righteous in all His ways. And if He is holy, He cannot let the sinner free. He cannot forgive sin. However, we find in Scripture that God does forgive sin, that God is abounding in graciousness. 
And He forgives those who come to Him and ask for forgiveness. And that ought to be a motivation for you to ask for forgiveness for Jesus' sake, for Jesus' glory, on account of the work of Jesus. But concerning that truth of God that God does forgive, Scripture also says, as I said, that He is holy and righteous and just and He cannot forgive the lawbreaker. Yet we find that He does. We find that very reality put forth in Scripture that God does forgive. And so the only way that God can do that is if He puts away the sin of His people. Is The only way God, if God can forgive sin, the only possibility is that the sin has been paid for by another. The only way a murderer can walk out of the courtroom freed from their charges is if someone pays the bail. So too it is with God and spiritual things. There must be payment. There must be a payment in order for a sinner to be forgiven. Someone else must die on behalf of the sinner in order for them to be freed. And that is exactly what the cross is. A demonstration of the righteousness of God that God does not sweep sin under the rug, but that He openly punishes it. And that by the death of His Son, He has accomplished salvation for His people by His grace for His glory. And therefore, that is what I want to make known this afternoon. That the cross of Jesus Christ was a demonstration of the righteousness of God. But before, before I do that very thing, it is fitting that I remind you and bring to your attention what Paul is saying here in the broader context of Romans 3. He is speaking in the first half of the chapter on the fallenness of man, the bad news. That we have sinned before God. God holds us accountable for our law-breaking. We become accountable to God because we have broken His law and He holds us accountable for it. But He brings forth the good news in the later half of the chapter by speaking on the reality that God gives sinners righteousness by faith. That's what He says in verse 22. He says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. And God is able to do so because of the death of His Son upon the cross. He says in verse 25, Concerning Jesus, he says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. That was that Christ upon the cross brought about the appeasement of the wrath of the Father. That He put away the wrath that we deserve to be unleashed upon us in hell. That Christ died for His church, for His bride, for His people. And they will never be lost because He has accomplished redemption for them. And so that brings us to the text which I just read a moment ago, which is a passage I'd like to highlight this afternoon. That Christ's work upon the cross was a demonstration of the righteousness of God. Look at what Paul says, verse 25. This was to demonstrate His righteousness. Now righteousness is derived from the word right, that being that which is not wrong, but that which is in the way of purity and holiness. And we know, of course, this is according to the character of God. For God is holy and just, righteous in all His ways. In fact, that word righteous appears many times in the book of Romans because that is one of the main focuses of the apostle in writing this book to highlight to the reader that God is a righteous God. That in all His ways He deals in righteousness. In fact, we find in the book of Isaiah and Isaiah 11 concerning the coming of Christ, concerning the coming work of Christ, that He would deal in righteousness. He would operate in righteousness. And that is because He is the true God and He operates in righteousness. He operates in it because He possesses it as a part of His character, as one of His attributes. And therefore, God in His righteousness cannot let the sinner go without being punished. He cannot pardon the sins of, the, of the, the wrongdoer, of the sinner, because it would be a compromise of His very character. That's why we find in Exodus 34, verse 7, that God says to Moses upon Mount Sinai, He says, The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. 
That is true. God is certainly gracious, compassionate, abounding in loving kindness and truth, yet He cannot. He cannot leave the guilty unpunished. And that presents a conundrum for you, friends. That presents a great issue for you. For you are sinners before God. I, by default, am a sinner before God. And here we are, held accountable. And we have no hope. The only hope that a sinner has is the work of Christ. The only true hope. The only certain expectation of salvation is accomplished through the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. And that is why you must trust in Christ. You must trust in His work, His intercession. You must trust that He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him, for He is. He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Paul continues, he says, this was to demonstrate his righteousness. Afterward, he says, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Now that would be the sins of the Old Testament saints. Those who lived before the birth of our Lord. Those who lived before the birth of Jesus Christ. Many people before Christ were saved and forgiven by God and allowed to enter into heaven after their deaths. How could this be? God is a holy God. God cannot forgive the sinner and still be righteous. This contradiction in the character of God, or what seems to us to be a contradiction, is not a contradiction at all. And such a thing is resolved in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. For God there at the cross vindicates His name. He clears Himself of any accusations. Because you can imagine people thinking before the death of Christ, how can this God forgive His people and still be a holy God? How can this God pardon the sinner and still be a righteous God? It is because of the death of His Son. It is because the death of Christ Amen. is sufficient. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. It is because the death of His Son is so perfect and so powerful and effective to accomplish redemption that God can be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. For those many, many years, decades, centuries, millennia before Christ, saints were forgiven. And God was patiently waiting for the coming day when His Son would purchase their forgiveness, would buy their salvation, would die for those who had already themselves long died in the past. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ accomplished. Not only did He buy forgiveness for those in the future, but He also bought salvation for those in the past. For God had saved them, as it were, on credit, and Christ had now paid off that debt and cleared such accounts. There is no salvation apart from the death of Christ upon the cross. There is no forgiveness apart from the work of Jesus Christ. As Acts 4.12 says, there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other name that you can put your trust in that will redeem you. And what it means to put your trust in the name of Christ is to believe on what the name of Jesus symbolizes and means. The very name Jesus means salvation. He came to accomplish salvation for the people of God. And so therefore your trust ought to be in the fact that He came to accomplish salvation for the people of God. That is what it means to believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God passed over the sins previously committed. But he continues, verse 26, he says, For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time. He is so emphatic on this very subject. He puts it forth even more so. He emphasizes it again by restating what He has already said that the cross of Christ is a demonstration of the holiness of God. For when we look and we consider the fact that the Son of God suffered for sin, 
we see that God does not sweep sin under the rug, but that God publicly, that God sees fit to punish sin and He sees to it that sin is punished because of His holiness. It is true that we see the grace of God as it is revealed in the cross and the mercy of God and the love of God toward His people. And that ought to move you to come to Christ. The love of God that has been manifested in the death of His Son ought to cause you to come to Christ for eternal life. That is surely true, but let us not forget that it is also a demonstration of the wrath of God. We ought to fear the Lord, my friends. We ought to fear the One who made us, who sustains us, who gives us everything that we have and everything that we enjoy. We ourselves, my friends, ought to remember that He is holy and He is not to be reckoned with. God is holy. In fact, a very strong example of this very concept concerning the character of God is found in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah writes these words. In verse 1 he says, In the year of King Uzziah's death I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of His robe, filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet. And with two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. These angelic beings there in the presence of God could not find the words to adequately express, adequately express that which they were beholding with their eyes. They could not find the words to describe the beauty and the wonder of God and the absolute perfection of His being, of His essence and nature. And so they repeat themselves, not twice, but three times over. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And then it says in verse 4, And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Verse 5, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. Isaiah, one of the most holy men in his day, respectively, stands before God, stands in the presence of the Holy One and says, Woe is me! Therefore let us not be so proud as to think that we can stand before God and boast. No flesh can boast in His presence. No man can stand before the Holy One, my friends. And ultimately the only way that you can possibly enter into God's presence after this life ends is by trusting in the finished work of His Son to save you from your sin, to save you from both the power of your sin in this present life and the effect of it, which will bring you destruction in the life to come. It is trusting upon the Son of God, His finished work. For He came into the world to accomplish salvation for His people. So righteous is the Lord. Nahum 1 2 says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. Verse 3 The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. God is also love. The, the perfect display of love. 1 John 4 8 tells us that. Verse 7. Actually, I'll start in verse 7 of 1 John 4. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. He certainly is, my friends. He certainly is.
But my friends, let us realize that the love of God was only perfectly displayed in the death of His Son, in the redemptive work of Christ upon the cross. So we would do well to consider that and to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. But speaking on the holiness of God, in that very holiness, God gave His law. God gave His commands, His precepts, which are not arbitrary or random, but they display unto us God's holy character. They show us how God is holy. Those of you perhaps who grew up in a religious atmosphere are familiar with God's Ten Commandments. Therefore, it would do you well to consider that these commands put God's holy character on display. They spell out, as it were, for us how God is holy and how is He righteous and how is He pure. Well, it is in these ways. Jesus summarized some of these very commands in Mark chapter 10. He said in verse 19, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. These commands again display God's character. For we see that God hates murdering. God is certainly not a murderous God. And He hates adultery. He hates spouses to be unfaithful to one another because He is a faithful covenant keeping God. God hates thievery. He obviously owns all things. He has a divine prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with that which He owns. Do not bear false witness. The book of Hebrews tells us it is an impossibility for God to lie. God is not a liar. And He hates lying. But we not only find God's character revealed to us as we look at God's law, but also we see our character pointed out. Because there's a contrast, there's a stark contrast that takes place when we look in the mirror of the precepts of God. Because what do we see? We see that we are covered in the iniquity, in the filth that we've committed. We see that we are covered in the sewage of sin that we ourselves are condemned. And the only way that we can have reconciliation with this holy God is through the work of His Son. It's through having righteousness because of the work of Jesus Christ having the righteousness of Christ imputed to us by faith, accounted over to us. So friends, put your trust in the righteousness of Christ. Put your trust in the perfect law-keeping of Christ as the basis for your salvation. For we have sinned. We have sinned grievously against God, against the Holy One. In fact, we find in Romans 3, as I mentioned earlier, a very clear explanation, a very clear explanation on how exactly we have sinned before God and how bad our state truly is. Paul quotes a lengthy section of Old Testament Scriptures. He says in verse 10 of Romans 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So this is thorough. This is straightforward. This is powerful. Man has sinned against God. He has transgressed the law of God. And therefore, God holds him accountable for his law-breaking. We have sinned against God. He actually says later on in chapter, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is that they have taken God's commands and they have not kept them as they ought to. We have not. You and I both know that our consciences testify to that reality. 
And so therefore, God in His perfect holiness holds man accountable. And therefore, we are hopelessly, helplessly condemned to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place that Jesus described as the place of outer darkness. The place of torment for the ungodly. And it is called hell. Man is so lost, my friends. If you're outside of Christ, you're not only a sinner, but dead in sin. You're not a sinner because you've sinned. You sin because you are by nature a sinner. That is, that you are born inheriting a nature, a sin nature. The fallen nature that we all inherit. Deadness to, deadness to God. Deadness in sin. A love for sin and a hatred for God. That's why Jesus said in John 6, No one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. No one can come unless the Father draws them for they are dead in sin. Unless the Spirit raises them to spiritual life. And so friends, call upon the name of the Lord that you might be saved. Cry out to God for mercy. Christ, in His great love for His church, laid down His life as a ransom for many. As a ransom to purchase her salvation. So cry out to Him for mercy. As Acts 2.20 uh, 20 says, forever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts 10, or excuse me, Romans 10.11 says, He who believes in Him will not be disappointed. Jesus saves to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. But there is a hopeless reality for those who are outside of Christ. That is in themselves or in anything that they could possibly do. Headed for destruction, they are indeed and without hope. Without God in this lost world. But my friends, I do have good news to bring. It is that God being rich in mercy as we find spoken of in Ephesians chapter 2, because of His great love with which He loved us, my friends, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came because before the world was made, before the foundations of the world were laid, the Father set aside a people unto Himself out of love, out of pure mercy and grace. A people that whom He would save. And He commissioned His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and to die for that people. He covenanted with His Son to come and to die for that poor lot of souls that they might be saved. And Jesus agreed to this covenant. He agreed to do this. So when the fullness of the times came, Jesus came down and dwelt among men. He came and fulfilled the law. He was born under the law, born of a virgin. And He came to fulfill that law which we broke. God's Ten Commands, as we find in Matthew 5.17, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill that is, that the Son of God lived a perfect life, a perfect life of perfect law-keeping. He never lied as we have. He, he's never stolen as we have. He never committed adultery as we have. He pleased the Father. He fulfilled the law of God perfectly. In fact, at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 3, the Father speaks audibly from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Eutychia, who can, who can God say that concerning but His own Son? And so therefore, Christ not only lived, but died for His people. 
died for their law breaking, died for their lying, their thievery, their lustful thoughts, their pornography, their drunkenness, their sexual immorality, their perversion, their selfishness, their pride. And upon that cross, Jesus Christ took ownership of the sins of the people of God. That is, the innocent one died as if guilty. The holy one died as if unholy. That is, he was treated as a transgressor. He bore the sins of his people, of the church. In fact, we find a precious passage of Scripture. In 2 Peter 2, in verse 24, it says, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. How glorious! The Son of God, upon the cross the innocent one treated as guilty, took ownership of the sins of the elect, and the Father required of Him that which sinners are required in hell. That is, to suffer. To suffer. Christ upon the cross suffered as the Lamb of God. He suffered vicariously in the room, in the stead, in the place of His people, out of His love. And that not only displays to us the love of God, but the righteous wrath of God, that God does not sweep sin under the rug, that God does not push it over to the side, but that God brings about justice, that the fine must be paid in order for their sins to be blotted out. In order for the sins of the people of God to be washed away, there has to be atonement. And that is accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. As the hymn puts it, upon the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. That is, the infinite wrath of God against sin was unleashed upon Christ for those few hours, and He satisfied it. It is gone. It is put away. And so therefore, believe upon Christ. Put your trust in the fact that He died once for all. That the atoning work is complete. That what all that you need to be saved has been bought for you by another. Isaiah 53 says, Verse 4, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. God bless you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Smitten of God and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him and by His wounds, or by His scourging, we are healed. Drop down to verse 10. It says, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him. How glorious! How wonderful! How majestic is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that the wrath of the Father was put away. It was satisfied. The sins of the people of God are gone. And so God can be both just and merciful. Both holy and loving. Because of the cross of His Son, He brought that about by His grace and for His glory. Isaiah 55 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for that? For what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. My friends, God is offering to the sinner to come and to have life without money, without cost, without effort, because Christ labored to bring about the purchasing of salvation for His people. And not only did He die, but He was raised. Christ Jesus is alive today, and He is alive forevermore. He rose again. The Father rose Him up as the public display that He had received His atoning work upon the cross as a sufficient payment for the sins of the people of God. 
that salvation had truly been accomplished, we could say it was the Father's Amen to Jesus' It is finished upon the cross. And 40 days later, Christ was exalted in glory at the right hand of the Majesty on high. He was exalted there in heaven. As Hebrews 1.3 says, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. Redemption has been accomplished. Redemption has been bought. And Christ, the great high priest, has sat down as high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And therefore, the call of the Gospel to you lost souls is that you repent and believe. Repentance is simply seeing that we have sinned against God, that we are broken over that, we are disgusted by our sin, and we see that Jesus Christ is a sufficient Savior and a powerful Savior. And therefore, we respond in faith. We come to Christ in faith. That is, taking God at His Word, believing that what God has said He would do for those who come to Christ, He is able to do it. It is believing that Jesus truly did die and He was truly raised. Believing that He did it for you. And if you believe such, if you repent and believe, then you will be saved. But repentance and faith are something you can't muster up. You're dead in sin. You're lost. And you will not come to Christ. The Spirit of God has to raise you to spiritual life. Has to draw you to the Son of God. Has to cause you to repent and believe. However, for God, for those whom God does grant repentance and faith to, they will come. They will repent and they will believe. By His power and by His grace alone. And for those who do such, their sins are forgiven on account of Christ's work upon the cross. Because they trust alone in Him. They do not trust some in themselves, some in Jesus. They trust exclusively in Christ. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. You're either the enemy of God or you're the friend of God. You're either in the kingdom of darkness or in the kingdom of God's only Son. Only begotten Son, that is. Friends, there is no neutrality with Jesus Christ. There is no neutrality with the Son of God. You either trust in yourself or you trust in Christ alone. And not only is the repentant believer forgiven, but they are credited with the righteousness of Christ. That is, the Father attributes to them Christ's righteousness, credits that over to their account. So the Father sees them not only as having been forgiven because of Christ's work on the cross, but also as being wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Himself. So He sees them as having lived Christ's life because Jesus was treated and looked upon by the Father as if He lived theirs. Do you see that? That's the great exchange of the Gospel. That Jesus takes my sin and I receive His righteousness. He takes my filth and I get His perfect garment of righteousness. So I am justified in the sight of the Father all because of the labor, the work, the toil of Christ and nothing because of my efforts. Salvation is by grace. It is all by grace. That is unmerited favor. But for those who are truly saved, something happens not only in terms of their right standing with God, but in terms of their lives. Those who are saved are born again. Jesus said in John 3.3, 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I said earlier that you are dead in sin if you know not Christ. And being born again is being raised to spiritual life. Being born of the Spirit of God and being made new, giving a new being given a new nature with a new heart and new desires. And friends... For those who are truly saved, for those whom God has truly granted repentance and faith to, their lives are radically changed. They don't continue on in sin as they did before. They don't continue on in rebellion as they did before. They are a new creation. I myself, when God saved me, I was radically changed. It was darkness to light. I had become a new creature in Christ with a new heart and new desires and new intentions. I now hated sin hated immorality, drunkenness, pornography. I was now freed from those things and I detested them and I now delighted in God and in God's truth. I now loved God, loved prayer, loved the Word of God. 
took pleasure in the fellowship of the saints because God had done a change in me. God had done a work in my heart. And friends, that is the nature of salvation. There are many who sit in churches and say they know Christ, but they're on the way to hell. There are many who have prayed prayers and they think they're saved, but they're on the road to hell. There are many who have been told by a pastor or a preacher or a priest that they're okay with God, but they're on the way to hell because they have never been born again. To be born again is to be radically changed. Every aspect of someone's life is going to be in some way changed if they are saved. So if you say you know Christ, my exhortation to you is to examine yourself to see whether you know Him. To look at the way you act and think and talk. Do you reflect what Scripture says concerning the nature of salvation? Jesus said in Matthew 7 these very words. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of My Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to Me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name and in Your name cast out demons and in Your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from Me, you who practice lawlessness. That is because those people thought themselves to be saved. They thought themselves to be Christians. But my friends, they were deluded. They were deceived. And many are such in churches today. My friends, God bless you, sir. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Mm. Many are on that road to destruction. Many are, my friends. But if you look at your life and you say, God has done a work in me. I am a new creation. I have been born again. I now love the things that God loves and I now hate the things God hates. Praise be to God. He has truly done a work in your heart. And rejoice and be glad for your reward and glory is great not because you've done anything but because Christ has done it all. As the hymn puts it, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. It is all by grace, all by God's unmerited free favor. Free grace, my friends. All ultimately that God might receive the glory. That is the chief end of all things. That is the glorious purpose of all things. To bring God the glory. Christ died to bring God glory. God is saving a people to Himself for His glory. All things redound to His glory. And so to God be the glory. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, Verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the, good, that you keep the commandment with, without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which He will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords who alone possesses immortality, and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man can see or can't, who no man has seen or can see. To Him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen and amen. Indeed, to the Lord Jesus Christ be all glory in all things forever. Amen. You lost souls. You unconverted people, look to the Son of God. He who was killed, yes, but raised as well. Renounce your life of sin. Renounce your hopeless, worthless existence in iniquity. And look to Christ that your life might take on meaning. Think about the evolutionary and atheistic worldview. There is no purpose, no meaning. 
no hope. But with Christ Jesus, there is great hope. In the evolutionary worldview that is put forth in public schools, there is no hope. There is no purpose. There is no worth to man. There is no God in that worldview. And we're all just a mistake, an accident, the product of chance, random processes. which is a lie out of the pit of hell. We have been made for a purpose, my friends. And it is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That being all mankind has been made for that purpose, generally speaking. So friends, turn from your sin and turn to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who frees, who redeems, who pardons, who raises to spiritual life, just as He called out to Lazarus as He was in that tomb. Four days, He cried out, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus was raised to life. So too can you, a dead sinner, be raised to spiritual life by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the life giver. You who say that you know Christ, you claim to be a Christian, Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Look at your life. See whether God has done a work in you or not, or whether you are simply a hypocrite. For there are many of those, and there are a, there's a special place in hell for hypocrites. But if you see that God has done a work in you, and you are saved by His grace, glory to God. And therefore, for you who are Christians, Rest in the truth of the Gospel. Abide in the truth of the Gospel. Feed upon the truth of the Gospel. And go and proclaim to this lost and dying world the truth of the Gospel. For the Gospel is the only way of salvation. Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. But the righteous man shall live by faith. So this afternoon we have seen here in Romans chapter 3 in verses 25 and 26, that the cross of Christ was a demonstration of the righteousness of God. We have seen how God is holy and righteous and pure. Gracious, yes. Abounding in loving kindness, yes. And in His holiness given, He has given His law, His holy commands, which we have broken and therefore brought upon ourselves condemnation and therefore are on the road to destruction, on the road to hell without hope. But God sent His Son into the world to die for sinners and was raised on the third day for sinners and now lives to make intercession for sinners. And whoever embraces Him and whoever falls upon Him and cries out for mercy will receive it because He is a sufficient, powerful, and glorious Savior. We have seen how the one who has been truly saved by this sufficient, powerful, glorious Savior will bear fruit of it. That they are a new creation, as 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, they have been born again according to the will of God. And therefore God is glorified in their lives. And we have seen ultimately that all things redound to the glory of God. That is the purpose of all things. That was the purpose of the death of Christ upon the cross. And that is the purpose of this very sermon, to bring God glory. So may God be glorified in you and in me and in all things as they forever work to His glory through Jesus Christ, His Son. And to Christ be all the glory forever. Amen and amen.